Hello, welcome to my latest video. This one's about pub rock or rocking pubs. Really the history of pub rock and um, rocking pubs because it's not quite the same thing. I'll explain why after this introduction and I'll go through some of the, the facts that I think are wrong in the history, in the conventional history of it because I think that it's a bit different. Here's the introduction and then I'll get straight on into it. Right, so let's go back to the start. Um, everybody seems to be agreed on the fact that pub rock started at the Tally Ho pub in Kentish Town, opposite the Town and Country Club or Forum, or whatever it's called now. Um, in 1972, when Eggs Over Easy persuaded the landlord to put their rock band on instead of a jazz band. Now that's not strictly true because um, there's been music in London's pubs for years. I mean, there were a lot of the venues, such as the Dog and Dumpling, for example, up in Southgate and places like that, had rooms at the back which were originally musical rooms. So there was music as well as comedy and all sorts of things in there. So, And also, there are a lot of Irish pubs in London, and many of the pub rock venues, or the venues that put on pub music or music in pubs, were Irish-run pubs where they already had music in. And also, if you go back to this thing about the eggs over easy, then obviously, if they were already having jazz on there, what is jazz? What is rock? Where does jazz meet rock? That's the thing. So they probably had rock bands on, but nobody really noticed. So, but it is convenient when you're writing a history stuff or you're doing something to say, right, this is the start of it all when often it's all blurry and um, so I don't really go along with that because I think there's always been the music in at pubs. Then the history will tell you that the important pubs were the ones like the Hope and Anchor, the Nashville, the Red Cow at Hammersmith, places like that, which is undoubtedly true. But the problem is that the people who ran those, it's a firm called Albion Management ran almost all those, I think, and they were very closely involved with um, people like Nick Lowe, who again was closely involved with Stiff Records and Dave Robinson. So what you're really hearing about is the history of Stiff Records, or the history of music as applied to it, because the pub rock, or the music in pubs, because it's not the same thing, because pub rock, let's, let's just get this straight, right? Pub rock is normally thought of as being like a, a form of music, exemplified I suppose by Brindley Schwartz or Ace, who were doing like American influence rock music. So that's one side of it. But a lot of the pubs had stuff on, which wasn't in that style. So I like to think of it as music in pubs. And there were a lot more of these places, like there was, which you don't really hear about. There was the Windsor Castle on Harrow Road. I used to go there because I used to live at 2A Hormead Road, which was a former Rackman. Um, I don't know if you know about that, but you can always look it up on Wikipedia. That was a former Rackman premises. I shared a flat there with a guy called Chris and we worked together in the same nightclub. And downstairs, there was a sex worker who was very nice and she used to come in at nine o'clock and leave at five o'clock and have all these people come in. But she was actually no trouble. In fact, we were much more trouble than uh, um, she was. So, the Windsor Castle in Howard Road was quite close and they used to put on, it used to be a second division sort of thing. You never saw people like Elvis Costello or Bringy Swartz or Dr. Feelgood playing there as far as I can remember. There were lots of places like that. There's the Thomas of Beckett in the Old Kent Road. There was the um, in, there was the Pegasus, which became Chas and Dave's in Stoke Newington. When they started putting on bands, it's very hard to say because it's... What would happen was, in those days, is somebody would go along, find an empty room, put on gigs for a certain amount of time. If it worked, then it just carried on. If it didn't work, they'd just stop, and then maybe someone else would come along. So it was very hit and miss. The places like the Greyhound, that used to be, again, separate to the Red Cow, Hope and Anchor sort of thing. That's where you go and see people like Mickey Jupp in the 1970s, and people like that. 
and then there'd be the Golden Lion in Fulham Broadway, which again had a reputation at the time. Now I'm going to get sued for this, for being a bit of a gangstery pub because I was there once with the Groundhogs, Tony McPhee, and we had a bit of a dispute about how much we were being paid. And before you'd even said, excuse me, is this right? Because the room was packed and we got like some small amount. And before we knew what was happening, we were actually surrounded by like heavy looking guys, as if to say, right. And in the end, they basically said, get your gear and go. So it was all very, that was just one example of that. Lots of people had totally different um, experiences there. So it's perhaps that's one thing that happened. There were places like the White Line in Putney where I used to put on gigs, the John Bullock Chiswick where I used to put on gigs. Not all at the same time, because I used to go in there for like six months or a year or something and do it, then move on to another place. Because normally, landlords or pubs will give you incentives to go and put on bands at their pubs. Because obviously they wanted people to go in to spend money buying beer in their pubs. So if you had a good band on or good bands, that would help. And so I was often poached and taken to various places. Or the landlord, like example, he used to help Steve Rundle at the Cock in Fulham, Northend Road. And um, and he moved on to the Green Man at Stratford and I went with him and I helped him there and I put on bands there and it was all very um, exciting. So there are lots of these places around. I am, when the, when the Roby opened in Finsbury Park, the, the Sir George Roby, I went there first of all for a punk gig with a band called Conflict that I was the agent for, though I wasn't supposed to be the agent for them because they were an anarchist band. So they weren't supposed to have agents. So I was billed as their friend and I used to help with the security. Oh, somebody sent me messages. Oh, God. And I, um, oh, shut up. Right, gone. So I, well, wait, so I went to the Roby first um, with Conflict as, and they were scared of um, skinheads and it turned out that they were right to be scared of them because one of the gigs I put on, a van turned up at the White Line in Putney and um, a lot of skinheads got out with baseball bats and tried to beat them up. But luckily at the White Lion, there were a lot of Irish workmen in the public bar and they rushed out and helped, which, which was great, fantastic. So, so we managed to beat off the um, um, skinhead, so that was good. But I think the gig was still canceled because I think some people were injured and things, but just like uh, bruises and stuff. But um, I, I, I digress, do I not? So just in the back room, it was named after the music hall performer because across the road was the Finsbury Park Astoria, which was became the Rainbow. So, uh, but by this time it was taken over by a Brazilian church, I think. So it wasn't really doing rock and roll. But so anyway, it it still had that reputation that it was part of that little thing because people used to go to the Roby before shows at the Rainbow. So I belong there for that. Then next thing I know, somebody which I didn't know at the time, but um, Malcolm Rogers and Joe Giltrap, who were in a duo called Irish Mist, took over with another guy called John something or other, who eventually became the guy who started Turd Mills, the club, Clerkenwell, that's right. So anyway, they were quite um, good guys. I did the odd Tuesday night there. I put on the Pogues, which was, I think, might have been a Wednesday of the Pogues, but that was a very big um, success and had to be stopped by the, the police because too many people were turning up at the end and it was blocking the road. That's what used to happen back then. You don't get that sort of thing now. I had the same sort of thing happened at the White Lion when I had, believe it or not, of all people, Crazy Cavern and the Rhythm Ruckers and, like, for some reason, Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people turn up to watch them on the same night, which is very unexpected, believe me. And it blocked all the road and they had a fate on across the road or something at the church. And so because the MP was there, I can't remember what happened. But anyway, the police told us to stop and um, they, they turned out that the White Line didn't even have a music license. So that was a bit of a blow. So we had to stop entirely. So, um, but in those days, we used to have things like that. That's too many people that turned up, which was not something that happened to me at all of my gigs, believe me. So anyway, um, the Roby, yes, they, they put, they started off being very folk and country. Joe went off to the railway at Finsbury Park Station and then eventually got the Weaver's Arms, which is very, very famous. The Weaver's became a very famous venue. Under Joe, he, he he did a fantastic job there, probably about 1990, because I was at the Cricketers till about, well, till September the 30th, 1990. 
Um, so I helped Joe with various things. I was also an Asian again. Um, so the, the Roby went more under Malcolm's um, tutelage or under Malcolm's shape. It went more into getting on people that would pull in crowds. So he went for more of the rock crowds and the alternative crowds and doing all dayers and that sort of thing and putting on lots of bands and things. So that's what happened there. But there were so many venues going in the 80s and 90s that you never hear about. I mean, there was the Bull and Gate at Kentish Town. There was the, um, the one at Canning Town, the Bridge House. That was Terry, a boxer, used to run that. Very nice guy. So all these things were like happening and you never hear about them. So I will eventually, hopefully, do various little videos about groups of venues and look it up and do a bit of history and because i still know a lot of the people because a lot of the people are still around a lot of them are dead now unfortunately but a lot of them are still around and i can ask them and ask people so i will try and do more history of um rock in pubs or music in pubs or pub rock or whatever you want to call it at another time so i hope you enjoyed this i know it's a bit rambling but bear with me because that's what I do. Um, hope it was interesting in some tiny way. I hope it set the record straight for some things and hope to see you next time. If you did like it, please like it down below. Please subscribe because it's always good if you subscribe. Please subscribe, press the notification bell to get notified of all my videos. They're not always on music, sometimes on writing or food or lots of things, so whatever. Don't think because you subscribed and I do something that you don't like, it's a personal insult. It's not. Just ignore the ones you don't like and, and enjoy the ones that you like. Thank you for watching. See you next time, hopefully. Goodbye. Now is the time to say goodbye. Goodbye. Now is the time to yield the sign. Oh, yield that sexy sigh, baby doll. <laughs> now is the time to wend away. Let's wend. Until we meet again. A goodbye, goodbye, we're leaving you, Skidlida. A goodbye, we wish you for goodbye. Fart a totter, a fart a totter.